it's um, been a lively uh, morning and uh, thought-provoking, and uh, we are going to continue with that um, theme uh, for a very uh, special session now uh, over the, uh, the luncheon. So again, I'm just calling on those outside. If you want to bring your plates in, that would be great. Uh, we've been um, jealously celebrating uh, John McCamus, of course, as the uh, favored uh, son of Osgood, which he is. But we uh, lovingly share him with all of York University, uh, now in more ways since uh, his role as ombudsman and uh, through a number of other special projects has um, uh, taken him throughout the university. And it's uh, with great pleasure and that dual uh, sense of uh, loyalty um, to the Osgood community, to the broader York community, and of course, uh, to years of service uh, to advance um, uh, our shared uh, interests that I have the pleasure to invite uh, our president and uh, the honorary president of the John McCamus Fan Club, President uh, Mamdou Shukri of York University to uh, say a few words of welcome. So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I wonder if somebody in the audience is saying, what is this engineer is doing here among all of these uh, brilliant legal minds uh, at Osgood Hall? And uh, I'm not here really because I happen to be the president of the university, or this is part of it. Uh, I, I, I confess this is part of it. But I'm really here because it's an opportunity for me to acknowledge uh, John McCammons. I came to York five and a half years ago, and uh, as a, in a sense, uh, an outsider coming in, it was very important to, for me to uh, learn about the university and meet people, meet people who, and, and find out about the people who have been making a difference and creating the university that we have today. Uh, I wanted to meet with people whom I can talk to, receive advice, learn about York, and, uh, and be able to do my job, and John McCammons has been one of them. So I am saying, I'm, I'm here really to express my thanks and gratitude on a personal level to John McCammons for the great job he has been doing. As you probably know, he also has been the uh, ombudsperson for the, for the university. And this is a very important role as he provides the university with advice and uh, really make sure that the university is implement, uh, implementing its own policies appropriately. And, uh, and in that, doing that job and being associated with the, say, the office of the president requires somebody who is not only knowledgeable and, and very wise, but also somebody who's trusted by everybody on campus. And I found that person in John McCammons. So he has done a great job for us, uh, uh, for me personally and for the university during my uh, short tenure here. However, when you look back and try and, first of all, I was just telling him that I discovered that he has been uh, in the business of legal education for 40 years and he corrected me and said it's 41 years. <laughs> now. Look at him. Is this a, the, the, the looks of somebody who has been doing this for 41 years? Now, it tells me that there must be a secret that I don't, I don't know. It could be genetics. It could be the legal profession itself keeps people young. <laughs> or maybe the frequent travel to Paris that does it. Because I, I, I have been running into him in, uh, in, in other places in the world. So uh, in any event, I know he has made a huge contribution to, the, to Osgood Hall Law School on to and to generations of, uh, of Canadians who are uh, uh, having great careers in the legal profession. And uh, for that, obviously, everybody in this university is grateful uh, uh, to John. He also uh, has been a, a, a dean of Osgood Hall Law School. And Osgood Law, 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 Osgood Hall Law School is not only uh, just a faculty at York University. It has a glorious history. Many of the great, great legal minds in Canada have been trained in Osgood Hall Law School, so they bring a lot of pride to the university. Uh, moreover, uh, Osgood Hall also being a professional school and being a great example of an environment in which student faculty and members of the external uh, community have an opportunity to dialogue and work together and discuss issues that are relevant to society is a great model for many other 
uh, uh, parts of the university and for other universities as well. So for that reason, I, I'm here really to acknowledge John, thank him for what he has been doing for this university, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. <laughs> All right, without further ado, there are not many people in this room who could describe the 41 years of John McCamus's contribution to legal education as a reasonably good start. Uh, one of them is Harry Arthurs. Uh, Harry, of course, uh, is our former dean, former president, and uh, always the heart and soul of this institution, and um, uh, very much so uh, in the role he's going to play uh, today to welcome uh, Rod McDonald, who uh, is now a triple uh, graduate of this institution, uh, and uh, we are so honored to have him uh, here. So let me turn it over uh, to Harry, and uh, we'll um, uh, move right into uh, the keynote address and um, uh, his introduction right now. Harry, if you're ready. My pantheon of legal academics is about the size of a broom closet. There isn't much room in it. One of the people who lives in that broom closet is the birthday boy today, John, and another one is Rod McDonald. Rod, in my view, is one of the most original scholars ever to contribute to the corpus of legal knowledge and thought in this country. He's been the dean of his law school, McGill, where he holds the F.R. Scott chair. He's been the president of the Royal Society of Canada. He's been head of numerous uh, public commissions and inquiries. But for purposes of this afternoon's introduction, it's important that he shares with John the experience of having chaired a law commission. I'm sure he's going to talk about his experience that he shares with John, and I'm going to help him do that uh, in order to ensure a seamless transition between his remarks and uh, that he's delivering and his remarks that I'm going to deliver, I wore a bow tie today. <laughs> so you won't know which one of us is up here. <laughs> the guy with the bow tie. So, uh, Rod, without further ado, if you're game, let's go. Well, there we are. Thank, thank you very much, Harry, uh, for that introduction and for agreeing to pinch it for me. I know that I will not be able to give my whole address, so Harry will come in when I, my voice fails. Um, I have a very difficult task today which is to honor John, to say something new and intelligent about law reform, and to do so in a manner that captures the humor for which John is rightly celebrated on occasions like this. I confess the humor I cannot give you. But I couldn't pass up the opportunity to speak about John and law reform. Let me begin by making three points that betray my inadequacy to the task at hand. First, given John's capacious understanding of the idea of law reform, it's hard to think of a single contribution that he has made to the law that does not constitute an exercise 
of law reform, chair of the ORC, director of task forces on civil justice and legal aid, chair of the board of CCLA, editor of the Austin Hall Law Journal, fast-breaking doctrinal scholar, stimulating teacher and colleague. This is a daunting record, and I'm incapable of covering it all in this keynote address. Second, anyone familiar with our respective contributions to law reform would know my debt to John. Much of what the Law Commission of Canada accomplished during my presidency could be recast as a pursuit of themes, ideas, methodologies, processes that had been uncovered and honed by John. Third, one of the essays about law reform from which I am known, entitled, Sometimes It's Better Just to Fix the Dog, was directly plagiarized from John's own evocation of the constraints on home ownership and using that as a model of law reform. When should you be content simply to fix a dilapidated driveway? And when should you do more? Resurface the whole driveway, rebuild the garage, change the side door of the house, and so on. Now, with this confession of academic sin out of the way, I now feel a little less guilty about having agreed to offer this tribute uh, to John as a law reformer. I've entitled my remarks, Law Reform for Dummies, Third Edition. Here is why. I aim to focus on law reform as seen by citizens. Over the past four decades, there's been a vast corpus of writing about law reform by professionals for professionals, and far too little writing about law reform aimed at the general public. But as the popular Four Dummies series reminds us, most fields of knowledge dominated by experts or by professionals are actually capable of being understood by a lay audience. In addition, my title signals that law reform is an everyday human endeavor. Citizens are meant to be legally active, not just through the election of their parliamentary representatives, through engagement in legislative consultation. They directly contribute to lawmaking. Moreover, in a liberal democracy, there will always be significant social space where the state leaves to them responsibility for elaborating the normative regimes that govern their daily lives. Finally, the modifier third in my title reminds us that the theory of law reform today is quite different from that which sustained the explosion of law reform commissions in the 1960s. The ambition then was to create a vehicle to coordinate the great burst of reformist energy aimed at improving black letter private law. Only rarely were there calls for policy analysis, for empirical studies, and for social law reform. In a subsequent round, more attention was placed on issues of public law institutional design, and interdisciplinary methodologies. Today, law reform in practice is entering its third iteration, where developments in legal theory inform how projects are conducted. With the recognition of transnational law, religious law, and locally generated law, sociologists, anthropologists, and scholars of legal pluralism 
now play a larger role in shaping inquiry. Surprisingly, however, only a few commissions seek to theorize how to undertake law reform from a legal pluralistic point of view. And remarkably, even fewer actually do. My remarks are a contrarian take on conventional wisdom about law reform and law reform commissions. I explicitly adopt a legal pluralist perspective. In the manner of the for dummies manuals, I speak to citizens arguing that they, not professionals, are Canada's key law reformers. And Harry, can I ask you to take over now? Mm -hmm. Much as I want this transition to be seamless, Rod's about four inches taller than I am, so I have to fix the mic. So let me turn to the first theme, legal change in the lens of legal pluralism. One of John McCamus' singular contributions to law reform has been his clear but subtle sense of what law comprises. Because he refuses to adopt a dogmatic view of law, his work has never been dogmatic, either about the ambitions of law reform or about how it should be pursued. Let me offer a brief statement of what I see as John's basic understanding of law. <clears throat> For John, law is a powerful and dynamic human institution. It mirrors and partly molds the character of a society. Over time, it comes to express a society's values and convictions, as well as its prejudices and pathologies. In giving form to many of life's important challenges, law shapes how we imagine who we are and how we will conceive our relationship with others. While modern societies have created numerous institutions like legislatures, courts, and agencies to identify and promote through law the values to which they aspire. The law comprises more than the rules produced by these official bodies. Some of the primary co coordinating rules by which Canadians organize their lives together are neither enacted by parliament nor formally recognized and adopted by courts. These rules arise in everyday human interaction. Many people, especially legal professionals, do not conceive this informal law of everyday practice and usage as constituting real law. Only statutes and judicial decisions or a true legal reflection of our society's aspirations to justice. By contrast, those like John, who have toiled in the manifold vineyards of law reform, know that legal artifacts are in constant evolution, and that institutional law reform occupies a very small place in the ongoing endeavor of legal change. Some 15 years ago, the president, as president of the Law Commission, I visited elementary schools to make presentations about law reform. On one memorable trip, I ended my talk with the following question. So then, where do we find law? A young girl was the first to respond and offered an unusual answer under the bed. <laughs> under the bed. I'd been expecting something like in law books or possibly in parliament or in courts or even in the police station. Her evocation of the gremlins and other unspeakables that hide themselves under the beds of children caught me short. Understandably, I couldn't 
formulate an intelligent follow-up on the spot. But some weeks later, when I was drafting the Commission's annual report, the penny dropped. Why should we think that law is only found in the organs of the state that make, interpret, and enforce official law? Regardless of what she may have intended, I took the phrase under the bed to mean any place that we would not consider looking or might even be afraid to look. In this insight, she was revealing herself to be a sophisticated legal pluralist and at the same time, an unlikely candidate for success in any law school. After all, most activity in law faculties today assumes that law is about using officially enacted rules, either to avoid having state power visited upon oneself or to conscript state power to coerce others into doing what one desires. But her unusual answer set me thinking about how one might go about reforming the law that's found under the bed. What would legal pluralistic law reform look like? That endeavor, I realized, would require jettisoning three postulates of orthodox law reform. First, that we have to accept that law reform need not be institutionalized in a particular way. A specialized independent expert agency would be only one site of law reform. An official law would be only one of its targets. Curiously, the mandate of those law reform commissions today is sufficiently broad to encompass under the bed law. But the projects actually taken on still mostly look like those one would expect from the policy development branch of a department of justice. Second, the output of the process now encompasses only proposals for legislative change. The idea that there's a canonical type of law reform is consistent with the idea that there is a canonical institution meant to handle the task. But under the bad law reform would have to embrace non-legislative strategies for legal change that reflect the same informal processes by which the norms of under the bed law come into existence. And third, orthodox law reform is conceived as episodic and discontinuous. Agencies are meant to make detailed recommendations to improve particular legal rules. Behind this vision, is a belief that official law is by its nature static and can only be changed by an act of legislature, of legislature or judicial will. But under the bed law is in constant flux since its constituting practices are themselves in constant flux. The legal pluralist rejects all three orthodoxies. Most crucially, in the manner of Heraclitus. Legal pluralists hypothesize change, not stasis, as the foundational legal condition, even of official law. Of course, the text of a statute can change only when authorized constitutional procedures are followed. So too, the language of a judicial decision is immutable. Yet this doesn't mean that the norm to which the words of a statute or judgment point itself remains fixed. Legal rules are meant as guides to human behavior. As long as everyday practices appear to track these rules, we see official law as stable. But citizens are constantly making their own law and constantly changing the substance of official written law. The crucial insight of a legal pluralist approach is that however stable the law in books, the law in action is always in movement. Citizens renew the law by living the law, often managing to redress the injustices of an official law that parliaments unable 
or unwilling to change. The unofficial practices by which this everyday law is constituted, followed and ignored, are the real engines of law reform. For four decades, John McCamus has been a powerful agent of law reform. Interestingly, however, his most sustained reform endeavors have occurred informally, in practice, in NGOs, in his scholarship, and in the classroom. While he's attended to a formal deposit of state law, his research has also chased down multiple sites of living law where people constantly make and remake under the bed law. That's why, whether or not he would characterize his approach as legal pluralism, legal pluralists would have no difficulty in characterizing him as one of them. This brings me to my second theme, sites and modes of legal pluralistic law reform. Despite John's experience in provoking and managing legal change in a variety of sites, many see his impact on law reform as best exemplified in his years as chair of the Ontario Law Reform Commission. Still, even in that orthodox role, he displayed creativity and a sense of the possible that was genuinely innovative. Throughout his career, John was not afraid to ask law's hardest question. What is the optimal means for achieving a particular policy goal? Embedded in this question are two inquiries. The first aims at instrument choice or the site of law reform. In any given institution, such in any given situation, what institution is best placed to pursue a law reform agenda? The second is directed to institutional design or the mode of law reform. What are the optimal methods by which it should do so? The past three decades have witnessed the waxing and waning of one such site, the independent Law Reform Commission. Paradoxically, while the ideas in general decline, the mandate, mission, and methodologies of surviving commissions have evolved to reflect the richness of contemporary conceptions of law. For example, the strategic agendas of the resurrected Law Commission of Canada and Ontario Law Commission have been oriented not just to the improvement of law, that can be found under the bed. So too their conception of the tools of law reform where the wild things are. In their work, one can find the intellectual legacy of John McCamus masquerading as Morris Sendak. Because these contemporary agencies are more connected with law faculties and official legal theory, their projects are typically focused not on existing legal categories, but on how social issues may be apprehended by law, what Hans Moore and Robert Samak would call social law reform. They haven't been reluctant to take their distance from mere tinkering with official law, leaving that task to others, private contractors, including lobbyists for particular interest groups, to professional bodies, accounting conglomerates, ad hoc royal commissioners, and ministerial task forces designed to address specific legal problems. Unsurprisingly, John McCamus has played a role in almost all of these sites of law reform, but his lasting contribution is in preparing the ground for 21st century law commissions to focus on the multiple unofficial legal regimes within which citizens live the norms of everyday law. In his final report as chair of the Ontario Commission, John reviewed the rationales for third generation law commissions, pointing out the need for an agency that could, one, adopt a longer term perspective, 
anticipating what kind of law will be needed in the future, two, take a multidisciplinary approach, and three, genuinely engage the public in the formulation of projects and outputs. His observations constitute an insightful foreshadowing of the path of law reform down to the present. Where law reform is dominated by the political process, the choice of project topics and the manner of their formulation will be controlled by the policy perspectives of the government of the day. Establishing an independent commission in theory opens the door to a less politicized agenda and invites consultation with the general public. John was a pioneer in reflecting on how such consultations should take place. He argued for engaging the public as early as the development of a strategic agenda and work plan. Today, commissions typically establish multidisciplinary and socio-demographically diverse advisory councils to assist in this endeavor. Formalized consultation also should occur during the development phase of research projects. Multidisciplinary expertise and socio-demographic diversity are once again central objectives in constituting project advisory committees. Through the life of projects, commissions now routinely organize scholarly workshops, information panels, and public forums to solicit feedback about the direction projects are taking. This phase of consultation also deploys electronic media, including chat rooms, online surveys, and video presentations to seek public input. And finally, study papers and public consultation documents have become key vehicles for developing and testing the recommendations in any report. Current experience suggests that broadened consultation at all stages of a project keeps the work more sensitive to the social impacts of proposals and leads to policy-oriented recommendations. Such consultations invite citizens to contemplate and articulate the normative structure of the community in which they want to live, while avoiding polemical expressions of self-interest. Finally, continual attentiveness to public input invariably changes the manner in which reports are presented and disseminated. Videos, CDs, websites, community forums, radio panel discussions, all of these expand the audience for law reform beyond legal professions, professionals, and parliamentarians. This is truly, truly legal pluralistic reform involving multiple constituencies reflecting multiple normative orders. Regrettably, however, despite the commitment of today's commissions to avoid capture by special interests, it's proved difficult to temper the impact of organized groups that seek to shape projects to address their particular concerns. Contemporary law reform is increasingly beholden to narrowly framed partisan, or Rod's phrase, nimby dink lobbying. Even when a project is designed under a legal pluralist hypothesis, inequality in the distribution of social and economic power can still defeat the diffused general interest. As the Law Commission of Canada discovered with its projects on close personal adult relationships and off-reserve Aboriginal governance, well-funded opportunistic lobbies can reorient the best-conceived social law reform agenda. The challenge of law reform today is to use consultation to discover when and how inherited conceptions of legal regulation implicitly marginalize groups of Canadians and to uncover measures to overcome their exclusion. This is the challenge John left us in the OLRC final report, and it remains a challenge to which we are still 
imperfectly responding. Thank you very much, Harry. I will now conclude. Some of Canada's most pressing problems do not lend themselves to legal translation through orthodox legislative action. Appropriate policy responses require research into social, economic, cultural context, as well as into available legal instruments. However, when governments give law reform commissions ends-driven mandate, these commissions respond by charting their success according to how many of their recommendations are implemented. Yet if legislation of action is a measure of success, shouldn't law reform be simply vested in departments of justice Excuse me. which are more likely to generate proposals that meet the political objectives of the government. By contrast, commissions taking a legal pluralist aim, approach aim foremost to tackle problems that do not immediately lend themselves to a statutory solution. They see the role as preparing the terrain for future legislation by increasing public understanding of various policy options. Art critics, speaking of the Group of Seven, typically hold that the group was not just painting the Canadian wilderness. Its paintings, well, the group actually created a category of knowledge called the Canadian Wilderness. Its paintings have taught us how to see this wilderness, how to interpret it, and how to live in harmony with it. In much the same way, jurists involved in law reform help us to see what law is and enrich our understanding of its promise and possibilities. Legal pluralist law reform means engaging citizens in dialogue through which they gain richer insight into their everyday normative lives. The key is to use public consultation to enhance the capacity of citizens to understand the real legal problems that need to be addressed. In this respect, recasting the symbolic role that law plays in achieving social justice is far more important than modifying any particular rule. John's final OLRC report captures the ambition. Let me paraphrase what I learned from it. Law is a precious societal resource. Sometimes, however, our reflexes about its forms and its purposes are misdirected. Instinctively, we respond to an issue by proclaiming there ought to be a law, rather than asking how the problem we face actually arises. Regrettably, our social legal diagnostic skills often leave much to be desired. In the end, the success of our law depends on us finding in our interactions with others, a framework of rules to nurture meaningful interpersonal relationships. Human relationships develop through the interplay of social, cultural, religious, and economic forces. And they also shape how official law acknowledges these relationships. In turn, this official law plays back into the diverse socio-cultural understandings that ground the multiple regimes of everyday unofficial law. It is often said that education is too important to be left to professional educators. If that is so, 
that law reform is also too important to be left solely to professional law reformers. In a liberal democracy, citizens are always the most important law reformers. They renew the law by living the law, often managing to redress the injustices of an official law that Parliament won't change. The practices by which this everyday law is constituted and modified are the driving wheels of law reform. Only if we have a reasonably well thought out idea <laughs> of the aspirations of law reform can we recognize the limited but special virtues of independent law reform agencies. These virtues can be summarized in a single sentence. Finding opportunities that allow Canadians to examine their assumptions about what they ask of law, engaging in dialogues about why their expectations of law might be unrealistic, and involving them in the hard work of building more just, unofficial, and official legal systems is the true ambition of law reform. Wherever and whatever means, and by whatever means, it is actually carried out. This, friends, is how John McCamus understands law reform. It captures how he led the OLRC, and that has informed every law reform endeavor in every different site and through every different vehicle that he has pursued for more than 40 years. What an honor it is to be celebrating this incredibly multidimensional and innovative law reformer today. Thank you, John.